Late in the day, Chatterton and Kohler had calmed down enough to get everyone together to figure out what to do on their last dives. When they walked into the meeting, they didn't have even the most embryonic of ideas. It was obvious that the best bet for making a new discovery was to go where nobody had gone before. But after two decades of exploration, there wasn't much of the wreck that had not been seen by somebody. Roger, is there anything more we can learn from looking at the main wreckage? Chatterton asked. Maybe more shots of the edges, Long said, shaking his head. The best evidence of what might have happened to that ship will be in the steel. The more we see, the better. But hell, guys, I really don't know what to tell you. Anybody else? Kohler asked. Kohler looked at Chatterton. Chatterton looked away and caught Wolfinger's eyes. Wolfinger shook his head and looked at Concanon. Nothing. Bill Lang's voice had a gentleness to it, as though he wanted to say something to ease the distress that he could easily read in the body language of the people around him. They had their arms folded across their chests, their shoulders hunched. Most of them fidgeted with their fingers or swung their legs. Their eyes were dull, their faces slack. There's a lot of heavy debris to the east of the stern, Lang said. Lang didn't often give advice on make or break decisions. He was a hired hand, there to take care of the gear. But he liked Chatterton and Kohler because they were so passionate about finding something new about the wreck. There are some large holes in the 85 and 86 surveys in that area, Lang went on. I mean, big enough to hold some major pieces. Even though that area was surveyed with side scan sonar, it's not complete. Lang said he had a vague recollection that divers on a French expedition with the Nautil submersible a decade earlier might have actually seen big pieces of debris, but nobody had paid much attention to the discovery. They had never been photographed in detail, never been studied for their forensic value. He might be right, Long said. Judging from what's left of the bow and stern sections, there are big pieces of that ship somewhere down there. In all their lives, Chatterton and Kohler had never been so glad to be handed a long shot. At eight o'clock the next morning, with a freshening breeze slapping the first swells of the approaching storm against Keldish's sides, Chatterton and Kohler shoehorned themselves into Mirror One. Chatterton and Kohler had decided to send both of the mirrors into the darkness to the east. They gained nothing by combing wreckage and debris that had been seen over and over again. Two mirrors in one place doubled their chances. They would land together far from the stern and fan out a hundred feet apart from there. Just aft of Mirror 1, Kirk Wolfinger and Bob Blumberg boarded Mirror 2. Two and a half hours in the dark seemed like an eternity. In Mirror 1, Chatterton and Kohler did what they had done in similar straits time and again. They talked each other into believing they were on the right track. Of course there were more pieces of the ship out there somewhere. The bow and stern sections accounted for only three quarters or so of its length. The rest of the hull had to have landed somewhere. It could not have just vanished. In mere two, Blumberg dozed, woke himself up snoring, apologized, dozed some more, snored some more. Wolfinger screwed his iPod buds into his ears and prayed that he would find something that might save his ass. The audiophone burbled as Mir 1 and Mir 2 made communications checks with each other and up to the surface. Roger Long was standing by in the radio room on Keldish. If they found something, they would describe it to him. He would tell them what to shoot with the cameras. In Mir 1, pilot Victor Nischetta swung onto an easterly course, reached up, and tapped on the screen of the sonar receiver. Big target, 10 minutes. Could it be this easy, Chatterton wondered? He looked at Kohler, whose eyes were as wide as saucers in the reddish haze of the instrument lights. A hundred meters to target, Nischetta said. Very big, hard. Chatterton had been through the same moment with Concanon. He willed that memory out of his mind. The only sounds were the whine of the thrusters and the whirring fan of the carbon dioxide scrubber. Nischetta maneuvered three feet above the bottom. Right over here. We got something, Chatterton said, drawing the last word out the way he did when he went on alert. Kohler thought, I haven't heard that, John, for a couple of days. You see object? Nischetta asked. Oh, yeah, Kohler said. I see something now. 
Not only were the shapes beyond their viewports not natural to the desolate sea bottom, they were clearly pieces of steel that had been riveted together. Is that part of the bilge keel, Chatterton said. I don't know, John, I can't see out of my port yet. I think it is, Chatterton said. Yes, yes, yes. I see it, John, I see it. We're looking at the bottom of the ship. Yeah, absolutely. Unbelievable. Yes, 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 that's double hull. Oh, man, look at this. Wow. The plates were covered with slime and rust, but the red of the bottom paint showed clearly. The sub hovered three feet above the wreckage, moving slowly across the steel plane below. From their viewports, Chatterton and Kohler saw nothing but the bottom of Titanic in every direction. They reached the edge of the steel and could discern the five-foot gap between the inner and outer bottoms. Chatterton began to laugh, a throaty cackle that he snapped off after a few seconds. We want to document this thing as well as we can, he said. At the same moment, he and Kohler pulled away from their viewports to make sure the recorders for the TV cameras were running. The question is, Kohler said, how big is this thing? Thirty seconds later, they reached the edge on the other side. Richie, that's bilge keel. What are you saying? That we're looking at the entire bottom? Yeah. The only way we're going to prove that is to go back over to the other side, Kohler said. Okay? Okay, yeah, let's follow it around. Nischetta steered Mir 1 back over the plane of steel. There's the keel, Kohler shouted. They were crossing what looked like a steel strap that rose an inch above the plating. Oh my God, John, that's the keel. This is the keel of Titanic. They kept going. Wait, 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 Kohler said. It's coming into focus. There's the other bilge keel. We've got all the double hull here, Chatterton said. It's a section of the entire bottom from port to starboard and what, 30 feet wide? Right, Richie, right. Chatterton slipped into the trance of concentration at his viewport that was so much of what he loved about looking at a shipwreck. No one had ever seen even a fragment of Titanic's bottom, the rest of which was deeply buried in the mud. If Chatterton and Kohler found nothing else, this was enough. There was no question that the discovery would make a sensational contribution to what the world understood about the doomed ship. Relief flooded into Mir 1. Kohler radioed the news of their discovery to Roger Long on Keldish. Then he called the other sub. Mir 2, this is Mir 1, over. Roger, Mir 1, Kirk here. You are not going to believe this, Kohler said. We found an entire section of the bottom, bottom up, on the seafloor. You're not going to believe this, Wolfinger came back. So did we. No way, Chatterton and Kohler thought. They've got to be on the same piece as us. They asked Nischetta to find the other sub with his sonar. The hard targets of Mir 2 and some large debris returned a signal from a hundred yards away. Wolfinger and Blumberg had found a second piece of the bottom that ran bilge keel to bilge keel and was 30 feet long. We're going to film every inch of these things, Kohler told Long. Is there anything you want us to concentrate on? Definitely, Long said on an open circuit to both subs. Shoot the edges of the steel on the ends of the sections of the double bottom where it broke. That's where we'll be able to see the patterns of tension and compression that have not changed since the night the ship sank. And be sure to give me shots of the tops of the pieces so we can see if and how they fit together. For two hours, the mirrors crisscrossed the red rusting plates, hovered at the edges, and painstakingly recorded the jagged steel that had once been joined to the rest of the ship. Mirror one, this is mirror two. Go, Kohler said. I think we've got it all, Wolfinger said. This is once in a lifetime stuff here, Richie. You got it, man. We're gonna take a look at the bow, then maybe the stern. Bob and I don't wanna have come all this way and not see what it looks like. Good idea, Kirk. John and I are going to finish up here, then scout around some more. It's a plan, Richie. Mirror two, out. A half hour later, Chatterton and Kohler decided they had every square inch of their piece of Titanic's bottom on tape. The trip back to St. John's was two days of relief and exhilaration. 
The storm that cost the expedition its fourth day of dives to Titanic built steadily to the south. But with a following sea, it was a comfortable ride. They watched videotape of the new debris, making sketches of various scenarios in which the pieces they found might have fallen through two and a half miles of water and come to rest on the seafloor so far from the main wreck. They wondered what could possibly have happened during Titanic's final moments that had separated hundreds of tons of steel from the bottom of the ship. Roger Long wouldn't risk a guess. Without a time machine, Long said, there was no way to know for sure what had happened that night. But he should have some answers, or at least some new questions, in about a month. William Peary wasn't at all sure why. But in the summer of 1899, when he was 52 years old, he let his wife Margaret talk him into a palm reading. Chiromancy, astrology, and seances were fairground attractions. But she had convinced him that the man who called himself Cairo, of all things, was on the level. He had read the Prince of Wales's palm, she said, and Mark Twain's, Oscar Wilde's, Sarah Bernhardt's, William Stead's, and those of most of London and New York society. His readings just make you think more clearly about the future, his wife said. It would be better, Perry told her when he capitulated, if Cairo told him the date of the next foundry strike so he could buy steel before it started. On a muggy, sooty Friday in August 1899, Perry clattered across London in his one-horse trap to the West End, delighted as he always was to be pleasing Margaret. As the chairman of Britain's biggest shipyard, Harland and Wolfe, Perry was used to a little bowing and scraping, but when he reached Cairo's rooms, a receptionist told him to expect a long wait. Three women in day gowns, hats, and gloves were perched on a red velour settee. Two men stood against a silk-covered wall opposite them with their hands clasped at their belts. A half hour dragged by as the door to an even more dimly lit chamber opened every few minutes to discharge a visibly shaken man or woman and admit another from the waiting room. Finally, Perry sat at a black lacquered table lit by a single candle across from a beefy man with dark, wavy hair who appeared to be wearing face powder and stage makeup. The man had smiled at Perry as he had walked into the muggy little room, after which his face had seemed frozen except for the movement of his rouged lips. You have the hands of a child, Cairo said, and you began your life far from home. Perry watched the palmist study his reaction, gauging whether his guess was right. In fact, Perry had been born in Canada to parents who'd left Belfast for the New World. If he had not been born abroad, Perry knew Cairo would have detected a tick or some other sign of denial and retreated to a figurative rather than literal interpretation of the idea of far from home. Perry nodded. Right you are, he said. From those three words, Cairo knew that Perry was Irish and told him so. He knew from his well-cut hacking jacket, whipcord trousers, white linen shirt, and flat black cravat that his subject was not a man adrift. Cairo put him to work in Belfast's most famous industry, shipbuilding, because he recognized the broad-shouldered, heavy-crowned features of his ancestry. The shipyards of Belfast were dominated by migrants from the Clyde River Valley in Scotland. Even an amateur seer would have recognized the scent of the ocean on Peary, a blend of confidence and humility that rose from a man who knew the terror and magnificence of the sea. Cairo said he saw a long voyage in Peary's past. Peary nodded, thinking of his grandfather, a celebrated mariner who had raised him after his father died young of cholera, leaving him, his older sister, and his mother alone in the fortress city of Quebec. The Perrys had endured a stormy eastbound voyage home to Belfast, which William had never forgotten. Perry never believed that Cairo was summoning his past from the lines in his hand, but he appreciated the bravura exhibition of observational power. It was not unlike what he used himself in negotiations with shipping companies, and he knew he was in the presence of a master. Perry felt a kindness for the palm reader and began making things even easier for him with more nods of his head to confirm his increasingly more accurate guesses. Yes, his mother had bought him a gentleman's apprenticeship at a shipyard in Belfast when he was 15. Yes, he had moved up directly into management. 
Cairo had noticed that Perry's hands were not only small, but unblemished by calluses. Yes, he was now a partner in the company. Otherwise, he would be back in Belfast hard at work during the good weather building months. And tomorrow, Perry said when Cairo felt silent for a few seconds. You are about to be honored in some way, the palmist said. And, Perry coaxed, and you will soon find yourself in a fight for your life, Cairo whispered. A month after his palm reading, Perry wrote Cairo a letter to congratulate him and invite him to tour the shipyard if he was ever in Belfast. Perry had received word that the Royal University of Ireland in Dublin was awarding him an honorary law degree in recognition of his achievement in shipbuilding. And he mentioned it to Cairo as proof that he had been right. What's more, he had heard rumors that J.P. Morgan was about to make an attempt to take control of the North Atlantic shipping industry. John Pierpont Morgan's financial empire was built on United States Steel, a syndicate that included every iron ore mine, coal mine, steel mill, and foundry in America, and owned more land than the states of Massachusetts, Vermont, and Rhode Island combined. According to the prevailing wisdom in maritime circles, he was leery of investing in things that depended upon the sea. In late autumn, however, a surge in shipping profits driven by the Spanish-American War began to roll in, and Morgan changed his mind about ships and shipping. With Clement Griscom, a Philadelphia railroad baron, Morgan bought a controlling interest in the only two American shipping companies serving the North Atlantic. He also bought a majority stake in Leyland, a leading British freight line. Since just those three companies couldn't control enough traffic to set prices for passenger tickets and cargo, it was clear that Morgan wasn't done. Nobody was sure where he would strike next. Perry dug deeper and found that Morgan had the backing of the United States government for his plan to create an American shipping monopoly. After making his deal with Griscom, Morgan had gone to Washington and called in a big favor. In 1895, his banks had loaned the government millions of dollars to keep the nation out of bankruptcy. Though the nascent trust-busting movement was gaining momentum, President Teddy Roosevelt and a loyal cadre of big business supporters beat the drum for Morgan's Navy. Congress created the American Merchant Marine and subsidized the operation of every ship that flew the American flag. Perry had no doubt that with such deep pockets, Morgan was about to make a move on one or both of England's celebrated shipping lines, Cunard and White Star. Morgan called his new combine International Mercantile Marine. Peary couldn't help but remember Cairo's final prediction from two years earlier. Harland and Wolf built ships for every company Morgan controlled, as well as all White Star ships. If Morgan took his business elsewhere, it would bankrupt the company that was a second skin to Peary. Perry had gone to work at the shipyard when he was a teenage boy. His mother, Eliza, had not remarried after her husband's death in Canada. In the summer of 1862, she had paid Edward Harland 100 guineas to train her son as a shipbuilder. The 15-year-old Willie Perry rented a room in a row house a short walk from the shipyard gate and settled into the demanding routines of his apprenticeship. He worked as a messenger, painter's assistant, and parts runner before moving into the drawing office to begin his climb up the ladder into management. From the drawing office, Harlan moved him around through the chores of timekeeper, assistant manager, scribe, and ledger keeper. Perry thought Harlan's, as everyone called the company, was paradise. Hard work produced fair rewards. Solving the puzzles of designing and building a ship came naturally to him, and every few weeks a ship he'd helped build splashed into the river Lagan like a round of applause. Edward Harland remained aloof from the energetic apprentice, but he knew very well that the boy's pedigree made him a good prospect for the shipbuilder's life. Perry's grandfather had dredged the sandbars of the River Lagan to help transform Belfast shipping from a desperate local enterprise into an industrial powerhouse. Harland also noticed Perry because he showed talent not only in ship design and engineering, but in finance and he made a point of extending the boy's time with the company bookkeeper, John Bailey. After Perry proved out, Harlan sent him back to the drawing office as a journeyman draftsman. 
But Bailey left his door open to the young man who continued to devour the complexities of shipbuilding contracts. In 1874, Harland and Wolfe offered the 27-year-old Peary a share of the company. With money from his mother and his own savings from five years on the job, he bought in for 13,000 pounds. Over dinner aboard the liner Adriatic a few years later, Gustav Wolfe toasted what quickly became a powerful collaboration. Edward Harland builds the ships, Mr. Peary makes the speeches, and I smoke the cigars. By 1890, Harland and Wolfe had pulled most of their time and money from the shipyard, leaving Peary as the majority shareholder and chairman of the company. The first thing he did as the man in charge was to open the books of what was known as the Commission Club of Preferred Customers. With the details stored only in his head, Peary negotiated a schedule of costs and fixed commissions with a dozen shipping companies. He sweetened the deals by taking more stock instead of some of the cash, guaranteed that he would repair their ships for labor, materials, and a 5% commission, and promised to have a dry dock available for those repairs. All he asked was that they give him their business and allow him to equip the ships with furniture, fittings, rigging, and anything else he could manufacture himself, making a profit on each of those sales. Six months after expanding the commission club during a depression that wiped out half the shipbuilders in Great Britain, Perry had 23 steamship orders on the books, and Harland and Wolfe survived until the economy recovered in the mid-1890s. William Perry loved selling ships, but he loved building them even more. During the next decade, he launched more than 100 for the members of his commission club, and the occasional drop in customers who simply wanted a Harland and Wolfe liner and were willing to pay top price. The amount of coal required to propel a single 10,000-ton ship across the ocean was far less than double the amount required to drive two 5,000-ton ships across the same distance. No one on the waterfronts of the North Atlantic failed to notice that Peary was leading the way in building ships of steadily increasing tonnage, which translated into more freight, livestock, grain, and passengers per voyage. In July 1901, Harland and Wolfe broke the 20,000-ton barrier with the delivery of the biggest ship in the world to the White Star Line. Celtic was 680 feet long, could carry 2,859 passengers and hundreds of tons of cargo from Liverpool to New York in less than eight days, had two of the largest steam engines ever built, and was by far the most luxurious ocean liner afloat. Until its christening, Celtic's nickname in the British press was gigantic, and its instant commercial success convinced Peary and other insiders that the world would soon see 50,000-ton ships a 1,000 feet long. There was absolutely no question that bigger was better for crossing the ocean. In the meantime, White Star ordered three sister ships immediately, to be named Adriatic, Baltic, and Cedric. At about the same time as Celtic inaugurated its Liverpool to New York service, J.P. Morgan pounced on its owner, the Oceanic Steam Navigation Company, better known by the nickname derived from its swallow-tailed red burgee with a white star. The White Star Line had been founded in 1868 by Thomas Ismay. His first ship was the 172-foot, 580-ton iron sailing bark Broughton, built by Edward Harland. Ismay paid Harland with shares in the White Star Line, and for the rest of his life, he built all of his ships at Harland and Wolfe. Morgan learned that the late Thomas Ismay had been a canny dealmaker who probably would have seen the wisdom of joining his syndicate. His son Bruce, White Star's largest surviving shareholder, was a socially clumsy, brooding, conservative man obsessed with details, who wouldn't even quote a price for his company. As Morgan's men cast around England trying to seduce either White Star or the other great passenger line, Cunard, to give his combine a chance to succeed, the shipping industry was struggling for survival. In October 1901, Peary painted a dismal picture for the Harland and Wolfe directors at their board meeting. Over four million tons of ships had been launched between 1896 and 1900 because owners had followed their typical but foolhardy pattern of building new ships at the end of a boom since that was when they had the money. To make matters worse, Peary said, 
all the ships that had been pressed into Admiralty service during the recently ended Boer War were now back in commerce. And if that wasn't enough, a depression was crippling Europe, the American corn crop had failed, and immigration to the United States had fallen off sharply. Price wars had flared up that chopped freight revenues by 30% and passenger ticket sales by 50%. Nobody was ordering new ships. Orders for dozens of ships had been canceled. Two old line yards, Earls of Hull and Maudslay of London, had already failed. If something didn't happen to stop the collapse of freight and passenger revenues, Peary told his board, Harland and Wolfe would not be far behind them. What Peary knew but did not tell his directors was that he had secretly been sending out feelers to J.P. Morgan with a plan to save Harland and Wolfe. Without White Star, Morgan's combine didn't have a prayer of competing on the vital routes between North America and Europe, let alone controlling prices for freight and passengers. Cunard had rejected Morgan's offer after convincing the British government to cough up enough money to prevent the American from hijacking control of the North Atlantic sea lanes. In return, Cunard had agreed to build fast ships with fittings for guns and armor that could be turned into Royal Navy man of war when needed. Stymied by Bruce Ismay's refusal to even begin negotiations, Morgan took a last-ditch shot at White Star through its second-largest shareholder, William Peary. A month after delivering his gloomy forecast to his directors, Peary met Morgan across the matched walnut panels of a conference table in the offices of the American's London Bank. Except for a stenographer to take notes, the men were alone. Morgan spoke first. I hate Cunard he said, and then spent five minutes on a bitter account of being stranded with his family on a Liverpool dock on Christmas Day a few years earlier, when the crew of the Cunard liner on which they had just crossed the ocean bolted for home without making sure their first-class passengers were on the boat train. It took us two days to get to London, Morgan sputtered. How much do you want for White Star? Peary stayed right with Morgan's abrupt change of gears from small talk to negotiation. Our shares are not publicly traded, as you know, Peary said, thinking he was beginning what would be many parries in a fencing match. White Star is worth whatever we say it's worth. How about 10 times your 1,900 earnings, Morgan said. Call it $32 million, $24 million in preferred stock in the combine, $8 million in cash. How could J.P. Morgan, the most celebrated dealmaker on earth, not know that White Star's profit in 1900 was a record for the half-century-old company? Ten times earnings was a standard estimate of a company's value that was used for only the most cursory analysis of its real worth. But a price based on 1900's profit was wildly inflated, and it would make the White Star shareholders, including Harland and Wolf, rich beyond their wildest expectations. What it did to Morgan's grand plan was another matter, Peary thought as he sorted methodically through the nuances of the offer. Once the deal was done, the combine, of which he and Ismay would be part owners, if they accepted shares as partial payment, would have to keep up payments on the stock dividends and interest. Overpaying for White Star was bound to make a huge dent in profits for the combine. As I understand it, Peary finally said, you already own Griscom's International Navigation and Atlantic Transport, Leyland, and the Dominion Line. I also understand that the British ships will continue to fly the Union Jack, and that the Combine will have British as well as American directors. Correct, Mr. Peary, Morgan said. And I hope you and Mr. Ismay will consider serving on the board. I would be delighted, and will propose the seat to Mr. Ismay, Peary said. I must tell you that Ismay thinks the whole thing is a swindle and a humbug, he added, dropping his voice and leaning ever so slightly toward Morgan. But I'll take your offer to him if you include this in the terms of the combine. Peary played his real cards now. The White Star deal, as good as it was, meant nothing to him compared to saving his shipyard. As Morgan brightened visibly, Peary pushed across the table a piece of cockle-finished onion skin on which, in the elegant hand of a Victorian bookkeeper, was a single paragraph. Builder's Agreement All orders for new vessels and for heavy repairs requiring to be done at a shipyard of the United Kingdom are to be given to Harland and Wolfe. 
but nothing herein contained shall prevent the purchasers from placing orders for new steamers and repairs at shipyards in the United States. In return, Harland and Wolf agree not to build ships for any persons not in the combination, except the Hamburg American Company, so long as orders from the combination keep the builder's works busy. Harland and Wolf are to be paid the cost of the work plus 5% on new ships, 10% on new machinery in old vessels, and 15% on repairs. This agreement runs for 10 years and is terminable thereafter only on five years' notice from either side. Morgan read it in a minute. Done, he said. Peary said, I'll take care of Ismay. Perry delivered Morgan's offer to Bruce Ismay on a frosty January morning when the ancient Liverpool docks seemed to begrudge the prospect of yet another windy, freezing day. The cobbles and timbers were slippery with the night's coating of rime, and the bad footing slowed the men as they picked their way among the sheds, chandleries, and tally shacks on the wharves. The first hour of a cold day working outside was brutal but the effort of stowing cargo, coaling, watering, mucking out ballast, and manhandling mooring hawsers banished the chill by the time dawn marked the peaks of the buildings on the fringe of the waterfront. The new White Star office on the corner of James Street and the riverfront strand where Bruce Ismay waited for Peary was among the first to catch the rays of the sun winking over the upper Mersey to the southeast. It was an eight-story ochre and white layer cake of brick and limestone set on a hulking granite base, ornamented with turrets and wrought iron balconies, and topped with three oversized chimneys already flinging their dark smudges of coal smoke into the brightening sky. James Street, as the White Star headquarters was known in the company, was a radical departure from the stately Victorian pile of the nearby Royal Liver Assurance headquarters, the blocky Cunard building, and the surrounding warehouses. Some called it a slice of New Scotland Yard, because its architect, Richard Shaw, had also designed the famous police headquarters in London and seemed to be merely repeating himself in Liverpool. Scotland Yard was originally going to be an opera house, but its owners ran out of money. Shaw inherited the two floors of granite already in place and a smaller budget to complete the building for the Metropolitan Police. He finished it with six stories of alternating brick and limestone, transforming a stalled project into a curious masterpiece. Twelve years before getting the White Star job, Shaw had also designed Thomas Ismay's mansion. Dawpool, a drafty monstrosity, with primitive plumbing that was impossible to heat because the place filled with smoke from the chimneys, no matter which way the wind blew. Some people wondered why Ismay stuck with the architect for James Street. Others who knew him better understood that the last thing Ismay would do would be to admit to failure as a judge of character. The public office on the ground floor of James Street was as austere as a mausoleum. Furnished in stark oak, its high walls sparsely decorated with two paintings of Teutonic, the first white star liner with twin engines and no sails. A portrait of Thomas Ismay, and in a glass case in the central aisle, the builder's model of Afrique, a 12,000-ton colonial service ship delivered in 1899 to carry livestock, frozen meat, and passengers on the Australian routes. The marble porter's lodge opened into a cavernous ticketing room in which clerks managed sales, bills of lading, and customs declarations. Every sound, a stamp snapping against its pad, a cash drawer clicking shut, the ratchet of a comptometer, ricocheted off the granite walls, giving the hall the efficient but chilly feel of a railway station. Perry was fairly certain he would be able to talk Bruce Ismay into selling to Morgan, but he knew from experience that convincing his younger partner of anything was much easier if he treated him with the respect of an equal. Bruce's father, Thomas Henry Ismay, or T.H. as he was known, had been dead for two years, after a cascade of heart attacks. Perry sensed that Bruce was not entirely unhappy about his father's departure. T.H. had subscribed to the philosophy that boys will not become men unless they are browbeaten, criticized, and subjugated. The older of his two sons had caught the worst of it. Joseph Bruce Ismay, who thought of himself as Bruce even though everyone in his family called him Joseph, coped stoically with his father, 
the teachers at Elstree School and Harrow, his tutor for a year in France, and all the other men who thought it their duty to stun him into excellence with mean-spirited criticism. Defying them would have been unthinkable, so Bruce retreated into silent fantasies of solo adventures in foreign ports where he knew no one and no one knew him. He armored himself with the practiced reticence that most people interpreted as arrogance. He learned to shut the door on their world and endure the fact that he was the not quite capable older son of one of the world's celebrated shipping geniuses. Bruce Ismay's apprenticeship in Liverpool ended, mercifully, in 1886. Either because Thomas Ismay figured out that his son despised him or because he despised his son, he assigned him to the White Star office in New York. More than 70% of inbound and 60% of outbound freight and passengers pass through New York's harbor. The number of immigrants from the old world to the new approached a million a year, every one of whom arrived by ship. To commemorate that flood of humanity and the optimism it kindled in the underclasses of Europe, France gave the United States a 151-foot-tall statue of the personification of liberty. Liberty arrived, coincidentally, as Bruce Ismay and his valet moved into a townhouse on the west side of Lower Manhattan, near the White Star Docks. Mark Twain called it the Gilded Age, and Ismay and his pal Harold Sanderson, who worked for his own family shipping company, took their places among the tight society of young, rich bon vivants. Ismay was not a smooth player among the polished New Yorkers, and many people who encountered with the aloof heir to the White Star fortune were left feeling offended by his standoffishness. Sometimes Ismay's social awkwardness even forced confrontations. On one particular evening, a mutual friend introduced him to the 24-year-old son of a mining tycoon who had just inherited a San Francisco newspaper and was in New York to buy another one. William Randolph Hearst squared his shoulders, lifted his chin, and stuck out his hand to shake. Ismay, startled by the American lack of reserve he had never quite gotten used to, hesitated a moment too long. Hearst turned on his heel and walked away without a word. Who was that again? Ismay asked Sanderson. Ismay stumbled from stag line to stag line until October 1887 when he abruptly abandoned bachelorhood at a watering hole called the Tuxedo Club by asking Julia Florence Schieffelin to marry him. She was the 17-year-old daughter of a member of the Knickerbockersy, the 400 men who supposedly ruled New York City, and a celebrated beauty who had not been at all impressed when she'd met Bruce Ismay on the circuit a month earlier. After their first encounter, the odd Englishman kept turning up unexpectedly as she stepped from a carriage or a doorway. He would mumble an awkward greeting, tip his black bowler, and go on his way. She was curious about the apparently shy or absurdly arrogant Englishman, but had dreams of her own of far-off lands. For Ismay, it had been love at first sight. At the Tuxedo Club, his awkward persistence paid off when Julia agreed to brave the elements and walk with him around the grounds of the coastal estate. Half in jest, he made his proposal and was stunned when she accepted. Their engagement ignited a storm of opposition from her father, who buttonholed Ismay and declared that there was no way he was going to let his daughter marry a man who was going to take her away from Manhattan. Fine, Ismay told George Schieffelin. I promise you that I will live here for the rest of my life. Ismay could think of nothing more wonderful than living in New York and being spared the pains of being a single man in high society. T.H. Ismay had other plans. A year and a half after the wedding, the young Ismays went to Dawpool for a midsummer visit to show off their new daughter and enjoy the best month of the year in the lush green uplands over the Mersey. The visit went according to form, with picnics, forest walks, trap shooting for the men, and teas for the women. At dinner one night, T.H. stunned his family when he stood up, cleared his throat, and told them he was retiring from day-to-day -day management of his company, but would stay on as chairman. Then, in no uncertain terms, he said that either Bruce would return home to take his place as president or the job would go to James. After Bruce caught his breath, he told his father he had promised George Schieffelin that he wouldn't take his daughter and grandchildren to live in England. What he didn't say was that he would rather die than work for his brother. 
there had never been any question that James was the family favorite. For reasons that were never clear to Bruce, his brother delighted his father rather than irritating him. With the decision still up in the air, Bruce and Florence sailed back to New York on the magnificent new Majestic, sister to Teutonic, and at 10,000 tons, the world's largest steamship. Schieffelin was nothing if not a smart businessman. When Bruce told him about TH's ultimatum, he realized that a son-in-law at the helm of one of the world's most profitable shipping empires was better than a son-in-law working as a minion in the White Star Agency in New York. He released Bruce from his promise, and the Ismays sailed for Liverpool two months later. In Bruce Ismay's office with the door closed, Perry sat in an armchair near the open hearth and talked his partner through Morgan's proposition. It's a two-edged sword, he said. The shareholders of White Star and Harland and Wolf will reap an enormous windfall in cash. But we will also own shares in the Combine and eventually have to pay for Morgan's mistake of overpaying us when we have to return dividends on those shares and any other money we borrow to stay in business. On the other hand, if we do not surrender White Star, Morgan will not stop in his attempts to take over our British, German, Belgian, and Dutch competitors. As a part of his Combine, we will have a chance. As its enemy, both White Star and Harland and Wolf are doomed. Thomas Ismay would never have let Peary steer so momentous a decision about his precious company. But his son had moved into a comfortable orbit around the shipbuilder. Ismay trusted Peary completely and was relieved to be doing business with an older man who did not make him feel like an incompetent fool. On February 4, 1902, the White Star Line ceased to exist as an independent company and became the keystone of Morgan's International Mercantile Marine, known to all simply as IMM. Peary's strategy for saving Harland and Wolf worked perfectly. The guarantee of all the Combine's construction and repair business in Europe cost him absolutely nothing. The windfall from his White Star shares would cushion him during the next economic collapse, whenever it came, and allow him to expand his shipyard to build more and bigger ships. Peary's prediction about the dismal consequences of Morgan paying too much for Ismay's company, however, began to come true a year later. White Star staggered under the shared burden of the nearly bankrupt combine and Morgan's inability to corner the market when he failed to gain control of enough other big lines to put together a monopoly. The shipping industry went into an almost fatal price war. In 1903, you could buy a ticket across the Atlantic for two pounds. Only a boom in travelers saved White Star and IMM. Between 1898 and 1907, fueled by American immigration, the number of passengers increased steadily from 600,000 to 2,400,000 a year. In 1904, with the Combine in the depths of its struggle to survive, Perry engineered a change of leadership at IMM. He convinced Morgan and the Combine boards in America and England to replace its president, Clement Griscom, with the man whom he had slowly, quietly moved into the embrace of his vision, Bruce Ismay. The price war didn't send so much as a ripple through the flow of business to Harland and Wolf. Under the terms of his deal with Morgan, the shipyard prospered. With 40 orders between 1902 and 1907, from the IMM companies. Perry used the cash from the surge in new orders to completely electrify his shipyard, which meant that he could be in production 24 hours a day. He also talked the Belfast Harbor Board into building a dry dock for repairs on liners up to 900 feet long. Alarms began going off in Perry's mind in April 1904, when it became clear that White Star was losing the battle for dominance over Cunard. Ismay was running his company and the Combine with increased confidence and skill, backed by Peary's counsel. But Cunard fired a devastating salvo against White Star's premier fleet, known as the Big Four. Celtic, Cedric, Baltic, and Adriatic were the first great ships of the 20th century, each of them more than 20,000 tons. Celtic and Cedric, 680 feet long, Baltic and Adriatic, 709 feet long all capable of cruising at 17 knots, with crossing times of under eight days. That spring, 
just as Ismay and Perry were catching their breath from Morgan's faltering assault on the shipping industry, a shipyard on the Tyne River at Newcastle laid the keel of a true giant for Cunard. RMS Mauritania would be 790 feet long and 88 feet wide, weigh 32,000 gross tons, and most unsettling, cruise at 25 knots with four revolutionary steam turbine engines. It would have a sister, the slightly smaller Lusitania, being built on the River Clyde in Scotland. Together, the Cunard Giants would offer unparalleled two-ship express service between Southampton and New York. The White Star Big Four would no longer be the first choice for the crossing. Nothing like the big Cunarders had been even a figment of a shipbuilder's imagination just a decade earlier. But the formula of building bigger to lower the cost of coal to carry each passenger and each ton of freight across the ocean was impossible to resist. Cunard and its shipbuilders learned, however, that building a big ship might not be as easy as simply scaling up a small ship. Lusitania was delivered first, and on its initial speed trial, the stern shook terribly. The ship had to return to the yard for weeks of repairs and strengthening, which required tons of steel angle braces and girders. At about the same time as Lusitania was limping back up the Clyde, Lord Peary, he'd recently been elevated to the peerage for his service to the city of Belfast, and Lady Margaret Peary invited Bruce and Florence Ismay to dinner at Downshire House. That night in the summer of 1907, dinner was intimate, just the four of them. Afterward, the men lingered in the library for cigars and, as Ismay had come to know from his time with Peary, straight talk. Peary was always working. Joseph, Peary said after he settled into a creaking cowhide chair. Peary was the only person other than Ismay's mother who still used that name. I can build you ships a thousand feet long that will carry 3,000 passengers, make 24 knots, and be as luxurious as a grand hotel. We'll fill them by making third class more comfortable than any other line. First and second class will be pure profit. Let Cunard burn coal with King Edward's money to break speed records. We will build floating palaces. I've never doubted you, Ismay said. But you know we'd need two of them to make the service work. Better even, three, to have one ship in reserve. And they would cost a fortune before we sold the first ticket. I don't think we have the money. All you have to do, Joseph, is borrow on the ships you have, Peary said. You own them free and clear except for the IMM shares, and Morgan is desperate enough to go along. You'll have one of the ships four years from now, the second nine months later, and a third if you decide that you want three, nine months after that. If you do it, you can leave Cunard, the Germans, and everybody else in your wake. If you don't do it, and they do, you will lose everything. William Peary trusted blood. He married his first cousin, Margaret Carlyle, who became as essential to his success as the iron and steel he put into his ships. Margaret had adored Willie since childhood. He was 10 years older than she, and during family summers in Antrim before he left for the shipyard, she hovered near him, hoping he would muss her hair. When it occurred to Peary that he needed a wife, he knew she was the woman for the job. Margaret kept his houses in Belfast and London, a gifted hostess for the stream of his colleagues, customers, and friends. At the shipyard, she roamed freely, a gentle counterpoint to Flinty Peary, devoting most of her attention to the families of men with troubles, grievances, and pain. Men died building the ships at a clip of two or three a month, and they were injured almost as frequently as the tides rose and fell in the Irish Sea. They fell from ships and scaffoldings, were hit by falling wood and steel, and were cut, crushed, and burned. Margaret talked her husband into buying a pair of motor ambulances to rush wounded men across the River Loggan to Victoria Hospital. Margaret was acutely aware of her role in her husband's rise to the top of his profession. She made a point of letting Irish society know that she was delighted to be by his side. When Peary was made a viceroy in 1909, the new Lady Peary went to the celebration gala at Dublin Castle in a sea-blue linen gown embroidered with fish and ocean liners in white star colors. 
She pinned a small white star pennant in her powdered hair and wore a silver comb depicting the bowsprit of a sailing ship, from which hung a veil of lace. Peary's managing director at Harlan's was Margaret's brother and his own cousin, Alexander Montgomery Carlyle, a gold watch apprentice who hadn't missed a minute of work during his first five years at the shipyard. Carlyle had a long, dour face, but he was a genial man whose passion, apart from building ships, was collecting autographs. He was known for stinginess and an instinct for bringing just the right amount of materiel and manpower to every stage of shipbuilding. Together, he and Peary had built more than a hundred ships. Peary's chief designer was his sister's son, Thomas Andrews, who had gone to work at Harlan's as a 15-year-old boy. Thomas loved ships so passionately that his family nickname was Admiral. The first ship he worked on as an apprentice in 1889 was the 566-foot turbine steamer Majestic, designed by Carlisle for the White Star Line. On an ordinary morning as the summer of 1907 peaked and fell into September, Andrews arrived for work at dawn as usual. The air had taken on a subtle chill, and the smoke of the banked riveting furnaces, forges, and kilns mingled with the carbon smell of cut, punched, and hammered steel. Just after the opening whistle, Peary summoned Andrews Carlyle and an assistant engineer named Edward Wilding to the drafting table he kept for himself in the drawing office. Peary pulled a roll of drafting paper from a leather case, smoothed the sheets on the burnished wood of the table, and weighted their corners with shot bags. One glance told Andrews he would remember the moment for the rest of his life. Peary had been a gifted draftsman and designer when he'd worked in the drawing office, and the confidence in his freehand drawings had never left him. The hull shape was a variation on the tried-and-true iron sailing ship with a flat bottom, external rudder under an overhanging stern, and a nearly plum bow, the same cross-section as Oceanics and Rotterdam's. Andrews studied the dimensions that Peary had noted under the profile of the ship. 850 feet long, by 92 feet wide, by 65 feet deep. Ismay wants two of them, Peary said. They would be bigger, but he hadn't been able to talk the Harbor Commission into building a dry dock in Belfast to handle more than 900 feet. Andrews calculated the implications of what he was looking at. Each ship would displace over 55,000 tons. The hull and machinery without cargo, coal, and passengers would weigh 40,000 tons, 80 million pounds. Half again bigger than anything else afloat. Bigger, in fact, than any man-made object that had ever moved. Peary's fluently sketched details of the accommodations were as audacious as the dimensions of the ships. They showed a first-class dining room with its ceiling rising through three decks capped by a stupendous glass dome, a Turkish bath, a swimming pool, a gymnasium, a squash court, first-class staterooms bigger than London hotel suites, and second-class staterooms the equal of first-class accommodations on any other liner. In steerage, there were private family cabins and men's and women's dormitories in place of the open decks of beds and hammocks that were common on long-haul steamers. The crew's quarters up forward were also a far cry above the traditional hell holes endured by seamen on British ships for centuries. These ships would be floating palaces, carrying 600 passengers in first class, 716 in second class, and an incredible 1,788 in third class, with a crew of 860. Peary, whose fascination with propulsion had known no bounds since his apprenticeship in the engine works, then unrolled his preliminary plans for driving these three screw behemoths across the ocean. Two triple expansion steam engines, bigger than any that had ever been built, would power a pair of 30-foot diameter counter-rotating propellers on the port and starboard sides. The world's most powerful low-pressure steam turbine mounted slightly aft of the main engines would drive a 15-foot propeller on the center line. Andrews asked Peary why, if the ships had only three engines, would they have four funnels as shown in the profile sketch? The first three will be engine exhaust, Peary said. The fourth will be a dummy except for a ventilation fan. 
Ismay thinks ships with only three funnels might be seen by passengers as somehow less grand than Cunard's new liners, which have four engines and four funnels. He wants these ships to post decent speeds, Perry continued. But they don't have to be record breakers. 23 or 24 knots is enough. Ismay wants to let Cunard, the Germans, and the rest of them fight it out for the Blue Ribbon for the fastest crossing times between Southampton and New York. White Star will carry more people in more comfort in all three classes than any other line. Ismay will be here with his pen and his checkbook next summer to look at the plans, Perry said. Then we'll have less than three years to put the first one in the river. Andrews had never seen Perry look happier in his life. Before Peary left Belfast for London, Carlyle dashed his brother-in-law's good mood. My health is terrible, Carlyle told him. I'm only 53 years old, but I can't seem to shake the pleurisy. Every day in the yard seems longer and longer to me. It's time I retired to my autograph books, my garden, and my bicycle. I can give you another year, maybe two, but I won't see these new White Star ships in the water. Perry was furious that his managing director would abandon him after he had gotten an order that could make or break the company. There was no question in Perry's mind that Andrews would succeed Carlyle, no question that Andrews could do the job. Or was there? His nephew had helped design Oceanic and dozens of other ships, but he had never seen one through from keel to delivery as the number one. And he had such a mild disposition. Could he manage 14,000 men? Could he handle the engineering, the supply and logistics? What if the pressure broke him? The last thing Peary needed just then was even a shred of doubt. Peary went back to London. In Belfast, Andrews prepared to run the first leg of the race to build the gigantic sisters. In midsummer 1908, less than a year away, he had to present the single set of plans for two identical ships to White Star. Andrews was thrilled to be building ocean liners that would stun the world because it was exactly what he was meant to do. By the time he had apprenticed, he'd understood Archimedes' law, which states that a body immersed in a fluid will experience an upward force equal to the weight of the fluid the body displaces. A ship floated only if it displaced an amount of water equal to or greater than its own weight. That explained why a steel ship with an enormous volume of air inside floated and a solid steel bar sank. It also explained why, if the hull of a ship were breached, the water flooding into its interior would reduce the amount of water the ship was displacing and it would sink. For Andrews, learning why a ship floated and why a ship sank was like being admitted to a society of sorcerers. Andrews knew that his responsibility as a marine architect was to make decisions that would strike a balance between a ship that would be built too heavy and a ship that would be built too light. Working from Peary's sketches, he began making those decisions, with Edward Wilding helping him calculate the dimensions of the steel for the keel, frames, rivets, and plating. The keel of a ship is its spine, as crucial to its existence as the cord of bone and nerves that defines a human being. When a wooden ship fractured its keel, it was said to have broken its back, Andrews fabricated this vital beam from solid steel bars three inches thick, three inches wide, in lengths of 50 feet. The keel bars would be milled to overlap and joined by six-foot-long rivet plates to form a solid piece running 850 feet along the bottom of each ship from bow to stern. The keel bar would form the base of a hollow box five feet three inches deep with walls one and a half inches thick, from the top and bottom of that box, steel bars would extend to the port and starboard sides, tied together by eight more solid steel beams running bow to stern. That framework would be covered by steel one and a quarter inches thick to form double bottoms for the ship. Andrews then drew the ribs. They would be steel frames rising from the double bottom to cross beams and plating 60 feet above tying the port and starboard sides of the ship together at the top. More cross beams at each of the decks of the hull also tied the frames together, forming a lattice of strength that Andrews reinforced with gussets and brackets at every angle. To further strengthen the ship's skeleton, they would have 15 steel walls, called bulkheads, 
dividing the ship's bottom into 16 watertight compartments. Andrews had to decide how high to make the bulkheads. Watertight bulkheads had been in use for over 50 years. In 1862, the revolutionary iron sailing steamer Great Eastern had proved their worth when it sideswiped a rock off the coast of Long Island, opening a gash in its side 83 feet long and 9 feet wide. It survived the collision with the rock because it had a double hull from its keel to its waterline, and 15 watertight bulkheads running up to an iron deck that completely sealed those compartments. Andrews studied Great Eastern and saw that the trade-off for dividing a ship into completely watertight compartments was inconvenience for passengers moving between those compartments. He compromised by designing the new White Star liners with bulkheads that ran only part of the way to the top deck, allowing much freer passage through the ships. The bulkheads would rise to the fourth deck, 11 feet above the waterline and 45 feet above the keel. Two of the watertight bulkheads in the bow would extend higher to the fifth deck. The doors in the bulkheads would be controlled either by automatic floating switches or by command from the bridge. Andrews calculated that the ships would stay afloat with as many as four of the watertight compartments flooded. The skin of a ship binds the keel, frames, and beams together to form a single gigantic girder strong enough to resist the force of the worst possible sea conditions. Because the White Star behemoths were so long, Andrews knew that the hull girder would have to be strong enough to span the crests of two or more waves, flex in the middle, flex at the ends, and twist in several directions at the same time, but not break. Smaller ships could ride a single big wave into its trough and then continue up the next wave to its crest, but not these giants. The British Board of Trade published lists of minimum specifications for building ships. An owner who accepted delivery of a ship that did not meet those standards would never get it insured, so architects submitted their plans to the board for approval as they went along. When Andrews drew up his tables of steel plates and iron rivets, he went beyond the board's standards to err on the side of strength. Nobody, not even the Board of Trade, knew how 80 million pounds of steel would behave at sea. He increased the required one-inch thickness for the hull plating to one and a quarter inches, and increased the diameter of most of the rivets from the required seven-eighths of an inch to one inch. The penalty for adding the weight of that extra steel and iron was four million pounds, plus the cost of the coal to move it through the water. To reduce side-to-side -side rolling and further strengthen his extraordinarily long ships, Andrews also decided to spend precious weight on a pair of beams known as bilge keels. These one and a half inch thick two-foot-wide, 300-foot-long steel plates would be riveted to the outside of the middle of the hull where the side of the ship turned into the bottom. Each bilge keel began 300 feet from the bow, ended 282 feet from the stern, and added more than 400 tons to each ship. For the top three decks above the main hull, the superstructure, Andrews wanted to use thinner steel, half-inch in some places, three-quarter inch in others, to save weight and keep the ship's center of gravity lower. The problem was that the thicker steel of the main hull would withstand the flexing of the ship at sea, but the thinner steel of the superstructure would not. Andrews came up with an ingenious solution that had been tried but not perfected simply because no one had ever built a moving steel object so big. Instead of building the top three decks as a single piece of riveted steel, subject to the same flexing forces as the thicker main hull, he would build the superstructure in three sections. These sections would be riveted solidly to the top of the highest, but they would be separated from each other by gaps that would vary as the ship flexed from as little as two inches to as much as six inches. Andrews designed the joints to extend into the main hull where they would end in a V-shaped notch. The gaps in the superstructure would be covered with brass plates and leather sheaths to keep out the weather, but allow the joints to move. Carlyle, Wilding, and Peary agreed with Andrews that the two expansion joints would not weaken the ship. Above all, they would save weight. While Andrews and Wilding concentrated on the hull and the superstructure, Carlyle designed the accommodations and deck gear, including the lifeboats and the davits to lower them into the sea. 
he too used the Board of Trade specification books. Any ship over 10,000 tons sailing under the British flag, they said, had to carry 16 lifeboats under davits that could launch them quickly. Carlyle also found out that the board had realized that the size of ocean liners had outgrown that 20-year-old rule and would probably change it in the near future. It would be better, Carlyle thought, to specify davits that could handle more than one lifeboat so that White Star wouldn't face expensive refitting when the Board of Trade increased the number of lifeboats required for larger ships. Valen Quadrant, with whom he had done business in the past, had just figured out a system of davits that could be rotated 360 degrees to pick up lifeboats stowed both beneath them and behind them on deck. Carlyle included the Valen davits in his plans, with 16 lifeboats ready under them, and either 16 or 32 more lifeboats stacked on the deck, depending on how many White Star wanted to carry. Bruce Ismay would make the final decisions about spending weight and money that exceeded the specifications of the Board of Trade. A year later, on July 29, 1908, Peary led a White Star entourage on a tour of Harland and Wolfe as a prelude to reviewing the plans for the ships upon which they were betting their company. He wanted Ismay to see how radically he had transformed his shipyard to accommodate the White Star order, so there could be no doubt that he was committed to building them. The shipping business was still in the doldrums, and Perry knew that a ship owner, even one in whose company Harland and Wolf had a huge stake, might get cold feet about making so enormous a leap into an uncertain future. For two days, Ismay and his men, along with Perry, Andrews, Carlyle, and Wilding, huddled around a cluster of tables in the drawing office as the White Star architects examined the drawings and specifications for the new ships. On the afternoon of the second day, Ismay told Peary that he liked what he had seen. He had only one major problem, weight. After the initial cost of building a ship, every owner wrote his biggest checks for the coal to fire the boilers, drive the engines, and move thousands of tons of steel, cargo, or passengers across the ocean. White Star's gigantic ships would burn 650 tons of coal per day, with a full load of passengers and cargo. Ismay asked Andrews if the ships would be strong enough with the one-inch plating and seven-eighths inch rivets approved by the Board of Trade, instead of the thicker plating and rivets in Andrews' specification tables. It would save about 2,500 tons of dead weight, which meant 25 tons of coal every day, year after year. Andrews hesitated. How could Ismay ask such a question? He had spent months calculating loads, stresses, and the strength of steel, and had recommended a thickness of one and a quarter inches for the plating and one inch rivets. Andrews knew that if an owner wanted his ship made out of paper mache and the Board of Trade approved the specifications, the owner would get a paper mache ship. Andrews had no choice but to agree. Ismay told Peary to use the Board of Trade specifications for the steel and for the lifeboats as well. Sixteen wooden boats under the davits and four collapsible boats with canvas sides would be enough to ferry passengers to a rescue ship. The ships should surely be able to stay afloat long enough for help to arrive on the heavily trafficked North Atlantic route. Why clutter the boat deck promenade with three dozen more boats than the law required? Late on the afternoon of July 31, 1908, Ismay signed a letter agreeing to pay three million pounds for the two ships, with the stipulation that Harland and Wolfe could bill him for extras as the jobs progressed. Perry countersigned the letters. At that moment, the ships the two men had been dreaming about for two years became Harland and Wolfe hull numbers 400 and 401. Until Ismay signed the order letter on Friday, July 31, 1908, hull numbers 400 and 401 were paper ships. The following Monday, the clock began ticking on the thousand days Andrews had to turn the first of them into steel. Peary made it clear to him that if 400 was not delivered in time for the beginning of the North Atlantic summer season in May 1911, they would face a defeat from Cunard from which they might not recover. For a decade, Andrews had been buying steel from David Colville and Sons of the Clyde River Valley in Scotland. Harland and Wolfe orders accounted for half of Colville's production. 
Andrews specified the same grade of steel for 400 and 401 that he had been using in big ships for 15 years. This especially hard alloy was what he'd built Teutonic and Majestic with. The yard workers called it battleship steel. The steel for 400's keel arrived from Liverpool on a blustery day at the end of November. A gang of men under two bosses unloaded the bars and beams from the freighter with steam windlasses, guided them onto single horse carts with flat wooden beds, then clucked and whipped the horses back to the slipway over a log road laid over the muck. With direction from the bosses who consulted sheets of plans, they heaved the steel off the cart at approximately the place each would fit into the keel box and bottom and went back for another load. On December 16, 1908, Andrews and a half dozen men from the drawing office stood on the spot where the bow of hull number 400 would rise, watching a gang align a section of keel bar on the blocks running down the center of the slipway. Andrews was glad to have started the work on the two giant sisters. But every day they were on the slipways meant more things that could go wrong. He had 50 bosses making sure the steel was where it was needed at the right time, and another 50 in the sheds keeping the cutting, punching, and fabrication of the plates, beams, and frames moving. So far, there had been no rumblings of a labor strike, but he was alert to the slightest ripple in the mood of his men. On March 31, 1909, as the frames of number 400 were starting to look like the lines of a ship, Andrews laid the keel of number 401. The riveting hammers rang around the clock. Andrews put the yard into the warm weather routine of three eight-hour shifts, hoping to have 400 fully framed and 401 half-framed by November, when the winter would slow him down again. Perry was having a good year with the order book, and Harland and Wolfe had 14 other ships in the yard. The workforce had swollen to 15,000 men. With 8,000 men working on the White Star Sisters, Andrews met his November deadline for framing the first ship.